Well, the gospel we just heard tells a spectacular story of healing. First, Jesus sets free a woman from what could have been a fatal fever. Word of her recovery spreads rapidly from person to person and house to house. By nightfall, every sick person in town had been taken to Jesus. Sort of like a, an old world Facebook. They all found out. And every person in town, sick or well, is now camping on the doorstep of Peter's house in Capernaum. The place where Jesus is staying. Jesus is undaunted by the crowd. He heals many people and casts out demons and many others. All of this is wonderful, but the episode ends on an odd note. Namely, that Jesus prevents the cast out demons from speaking because they knew him. He didn't want them to identify him. Although what Jesus does is spectacular, he tries to keep it under wraps and we're left to wonder why. If Jesus was interested only in keeping demons silent and go about his work, then there'd be one thing, but on several other occasions, Jesus attempts to silence people. Not just demons, but the many mighty works that he had performed. He seems insistent on avoiding publicity. Again, we're left to wonder why. We also are left to wonder just how he expects such marvels to remain a secret. For example, after today's gospel, the next episode will be related in Mark will account for the healing by Jesus of someone suffering from leprosy. Now, Jesus asked the former leper to tell no one of his recovery. And, but he can't, you know, come. We, we're looking at a leper, and now we're looking at a former leper. This person is simply cured, not just of a skin disease, but leaves the margins of society and goes for mainstream. Imagine this person facing questions about what happened. Folks are going to notice. When I saw you yesterday, you were a leper, and now you're not. What happened? This restored person would be compelled to tell the wonderful story and tell the story the ex-leper does. For scripture says, he proclaimed it freely. So freely, in fact, that Jesus could no longer travel openly. He would be mobbed like a rock star. So, is that the reason Jesus didn't want publicity? Was it an issue of crowd control or maintaining his privacy or not getting trampled by people eager for his healing? This theme in the gospel is known as the messianic secret and is so significant that the simple crowd control cannot begin to explain it. Something more mysterious is happening here. Jesus does not want to be identified simply as someone who heals the sick and casts out demons. Doing these things is important, a sign of the reign of God come near, but it's not the most important. Jesus cannot understand, cannot be understood unless the death is taken into account. He cannot be understood without factoring in events and have not yet occurred. For that moment, it's better to treat him as an enigma, a mystery. One misunderstanding would li limit Jesus as being an exorcist or a healer. An even greater misunderstanding would be to see him raising up an army against the Roman occupation. Attempting to establish Israel as an empire as it aspired under David. Even though Jesus doesn't function as an exorcist or a healer, he never engages in violence. Instead, he chose the way of nonviolent resistance, an alternative that continues to challenge his followers to this day. 
The identity of ministry of Jesus cannot be understood apart from his death. But his death is no peaceful one. He undergoes a torturous death, shameful and unjust. It's a sacrificial death. He walks into it willingly. He would prefer to have his cup pass him by if the Father would allow it. But Jesus resists being trumpeted as the Messiah of his people apart from his suffering and his death. The crown of thorns must be part of his regalia. The cross must be his throne. Anything less would be not just incomplete, but a succumbing temptation. The gospel story starts with a spectacular healing, but runs on through the bitter Passion Week to the burial on the Sabbath garden scene with the women arriving early and fleeing, gripped with terror at the amazement because there is in the gardens an angel, and he announces to them that Jesus is gone. Here, what is true of Christ holds true also of a Christian. Our lives make no sense apart from our own death and resurrection. Our stories are not complete. This, we start to understand them only when we see what happens to us as part of the story for the grander. The passion and the exaltation of Christ. In our baptism, we die on the cross with Christ and we are buried along with him. And from the grave, we rise with him. Then all our subsequent dying incidents, both large and small, happen under the emblem of the cross and culminate in our last death, our final and glorious resurrection. There's a messianic secret. No Christ without dying and rising. There is another secret also, that dying and rising defines us as Christians, and that for all of this motion during earthly life, back and forth, from the grave to the light, we are never dropped by the hands of God. In his preaching at Riverside Church in New York City, William Stone Coffin distinguished more than once between protection and support. God doesn't provide protection. Bad things do happen. The world can be a dangerous place, but God always supports us. We're lifted up from a thousand deaths here in life, and we will be lifted up for the final one as well. Indeed, we are lifted up already from the final one because if we belong to Christ, and if Christ is risen from the dead, if it was truth that shocked those women at the tomb, then with him we are raised as well by the counter-gravity of God. That law which Christ published when he declared, and I, when I am lifted up from earth, will draw everybody and everything to myself. We must recognize that our existence involves more than solving problems and exercising power. Even though power and problems occupy so much of our attention, for repeatedly we encounter the different forms of death. These deaths have no solution. They're the problem past all problems. But even these deaths can become the theater where power of a singular kind is exercised. The power of resurrection, which belongs to God alone, Christ still heals, and he did on that day. He not only heals our bodies, but our souls. Our minds, our hearts, our memories, our relationships, our families, our social structures, Christ still heals. He does so through physicians and nurses, counselors, clergy, teachers, parents, and friends who meet for a cup of coffee. All true healing is the work of Christ. It's for each of us to ask ourselves now, where is Christ at work in healing me? In what aspect of my life do I feel his touch? Do I see his light? How is Christ now at work in my life? 
to change me that I become the person God wills for me to be. Each of us would do well to spend some time with that question, both today and in days to come. Where is Christ at work in healing me? This power appears against the face of death. This power of an utterly singular kind does not bring a solution, but a surprise. A rising from death. A life that is new. If you're searching, then you may well want to look in a place where your power is absent. And the problems remain stubborn. Yet you notice the smell of resurrection. Amen.